found the dot. Well, good morning again, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time away for a few hours uh, this morning. Hope you can stay all the way through. Uh, we started with a little breakfast and a little bit of a, a meal, a little bit now of a spiritual meal. It's so good to be able to gather together in the in the winter time, a kind of a spring training time in a way, getting ready for the year of ministry, the year of really, uh, as a church, collectively getting together to say, hey, we're on mission together, we're going to advance the mission together, and so I'm thankful that you men decided that this is important, that it's on the, on the list of things to do that are very important here on uh, February 10th. I hear there's all kinds of Super Bowl stuff. And we realized that uh, the speaker that God would have us to use needed to get out of Las Vegas because he didn't want to be there to watch. I mean, first of all, how in the world did you ever land a Super Bowl in Las Vegas? Woo! And now just pick, out your phone, pick up your phone and start doing a little DraftKings and you can bet on everything. Deal? No deal. <laughs> no deal. But uh, it just shows you how the sands of time do move along, and the world is the world, but the God of the universe is still the God of all the earth, as it says in Joshua. He is the God of all the earth. He's the Lord of all the earth, and that's a proclamation from God himself about himself, about his word. We're at our conference, and the title is The Cause, His Glory, His Presence, and, and so I'm looking forward to our time together uh, Mike Matovich is a true friend of First Bible, a true friend of mine. I'm so very, very thankful um, that we have had some neat times in the Lord together that truly are to his glory. You just think back of some of the times. And, and uh, in our men's conference, Mike has been part of them. You know, it's incorporated oftentimes with our I am uh, board meeting and things like that. We had uh, one of those crazy things yesterday, and that was good for us. And and of course, uh, Ro Porter has been here to speak, and Mike has, and uh, God has used them. There's never been a, a moment of disappointment, always a time of walking away saying we need more, and we want more. So uh, Mike has been in ministry for over 50 years, give or take. Uh, Mike has seen a lot of things, almost everything, no, almost, but I've been out in Vegas and pastoring Paradise Church in Las Vegas for 45 years plus we'll just use plus and uh, it's over 10 and under 100 and that's good but uh, it brings a wealth of wisdom most of all a wealth of the Lord Jesus Christ and a filling of the Spirit of God he loves the Word of God loves to teach and preach the Word of God it's clear that God has anointed this man and so I'm very thankful we can have him so let's welcome Pastor Mike Matovich Mike it's all yours have a good time. They're all yours. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.
It's like something that God wants to give to us if we'll just take it. But it starts with an idea. And I want to talk to you about that today at this particular session because I think it's, it's just important that we find ourselves in a place where we, we know what was God thinking. What was God thinking when he did all this? As I started reading, I, was, I told uh, Mark, I said, you know, I, I kept digging and digging and digging and digging. And the Bible is an infinitely deep book because it's the mind of God. And we're just barely scratching the surface of it. But in, in 1 Kings chapter 8, it's an amazing story about all that transpired up until this point. And this is somewhere around 1000 to 1004 BC at the dedication of the temple. So we've already had 3000 years of human history gone on. And here we are 3000 years later from that period of time. And we're still talking about what God did in this event that he has right here for us right now. So in the Bible, if you'll look at it with me in 1 Kings chapter 8, I want to open with these two verses. I mean, you've seen them, you've probably heard them before. And it says this in 1 Kings 8, verse 10. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Filled the house of the Lord. So that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house. Of the Lord. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. It's the house of the Lord that filled the house of the Lord. It's God's house. You are God's house if you're a born again person. If you know Christ as your Savior, you are born again and you have that in there. Let me just say this also at the beginning the greatest tragedy in life that I've discovered is not death, but life without a reason. It's dangerous to be alive and not know why you were given life. And I run across people every single day, saved or lost, that don't know what the purpose of their life is. And if you don't know, you'll never really be fulfilled. This is why people bounce around all the time, go here to there, go to this church, go to that church. They take this job, they take that job. They want this degree, that degree. They have no concept of purpose. And you need to get that down solid in your life, that what God did in 1 Kings chapter 8 was on purpose. He did everything on purpose. Solomon did everything on purpose. Uh, in my research, I discovered that they spent probably somewhere around $400 billion in today's money on building that temple. And if you look at the size of the temple dimensionally, it's not really a big project. But it had everything in it, not counting the items that went into it, which was another 16 to $20 billion. Again, it's just a guesstimate because no one really knows for sure. This is a lot of money. That took a lot of time. The craftsmen that they hired to build all this stuff was amazing. They were so super talented without any kind of a Home Depot or a Lowe's to help them out. These guys were skilled at this stuff, and they worked tediously at making every detail perfectly as God told Moses to make it, as God helped Solomon to understand from the building of the tabernacle. Everything was done on purpose. What you're doing in your church, what Mark is doing in leading and others that are on the staff here are leading on purpose to get you somewhere. When you go on a missions trip, there's planning that goes involved, gets involved with planes and passports or visas and all those things. Those are all done on purpose. You're here today. I hope that you're here on purpose. You came to get something from God. Mike doesn't have much to say, but God has a lot to say to us. The pattern that's in the Word of God is so amazing because the pattern is so supernatural and it's so far above our comprehension to try to figure out what was going on here. If you go back, because what I tried to do in putting this message together and this information together was to sit down and go, ask myself this question, what was God really thinking about? But I wanted to go back beyond the temple. I wanted to go back beyond the tabernacle. I wanted to go back to Genesis 1. 1. What was in his mind when he made all this stuff? You know, God is invisible. Nobody is going to see the Father, the Bible says. God had a supernatural realm that was invisible to whatever we would consider the visible world, but there was no visible world. So what God did, who was invisible, made something that was visible, and he had a purpose for it. This earth has a purpose, and it's not just so we can save it from climate change or have electric cars 
or get rid of our gas stoves or whatever else that these people come up with. But that's what happens when that's all your whole world. They don't see the real world. And I look back at the Bible and I see where the pattern of God is working supernaturally in the lives of people, lives of men. He started in Exodus 19 when he hits uh, Moses and he comes down in a very thick cloud. You can't see it. If you read back in Exodus chapter 20 and chapter 20, uh, verse 22, you see when Moses is called up to the mountain, Mount Sinai, there's this like fire, smoke, and everything else going on on top of this mountain. And he has Moses come in to the cloud, come into where I'm at. Isn't it ironic? We have everything now on the cloud, right? What is it? It's a wealth of knowledge. It's a wealth of information. It's a wealth of connection. It's a treasure trove of information, right? In the cloud. And the Bible says he goes into the cloud and he's on the top of Mount Sinai. In verse number 22, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Now, this, is, this, is, this really gets to me. Because he's, God is on the mountain in the thick cloud talking to Moses. And he says, Moses, I want you to go tell the people that I talk to you from heaven. Heaven was right on the top of the mountain. Isn't, aren't we always praying, God, come down to be with us? Well, God is down with us. The problem is we're distracted with this world and we don't see what he's doing. We get upset. We get irritated because the traffic is bad or our team didn't win, which mine, of course, hasn't won for many, many years, unfortunately, since Peyton Manning left Denver. But anyway, that's another story. But he is there on the top of that mountain, and he says, I talk to you from heaven. Now, he may have talked to him in a prayer somewhere, but the Bible says he's in this cloud on the top of the mountain. Mount Sinai is not a real tall mountain like in Colorado, over, you know, 18,000, 20,000 feet. No, they're not like that. If you go on down a little further, in Exodus chapter 24, verse 15, it says, And Moses went up to the mount, and the cloud covered the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. God made Moses wait six days to come up on the seventh day. And so if you think about it, he's coming up on a Sabbath day to the day of rest to have a presence with God. Just a footnote, do you guys do a Sabbath in your life? I'm not talking you watch it religiously like, you know, you don't do anything on Saturday. I'm talking about do you take a day of rest and focus on God? What I've discovered in the last few years is people are so busy. Their kids are involved in this and that and everything else. And you're running to and fro. You've got to shop. You've got to do. And there's no day where you take a day to just think about God. Where you focus on God. You've, you love God. You talk to him. You listen to him. But it says he waited six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. This is another time. Out of the midst of the cloud, verse 17, And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. So they're looking up at the mountain, and they're seeing all this stuff going on up there, and they're captivated by it. It's kind of like we do. We get distracted with the show as opposed to the content. We get distracted with personalities instead of the person. Here the Bible says he called him up, and so he did this in the sight of of the mountain of the, eye, of the eyes of the people to see this, verse 18. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses went in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. If you read Exodus 34, he goes back and he talks about this. And he had no food and no drink for 40 days. Now, how do you do that in this climate? You know what? When you're in the presence of God and he speaks to you from heaven, Moses got a chance to go into something that we don't understand. That's how he could go 40 days without food and water. Now, Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter 4 for 40 days without water and food, and yet he hungered. And that's another story. We'll talk about that in a moment. Ezekiel, I was, I was sharing with uh, Mark last week, or with our people last week, this verse, as I was reading through and preparing for this, just stuck out at me. It's in Ezekiel chapter 1. Because in the Bible, there's only like four occasions where anybody sees the throne of God or they see something angelic as far as up and high, like Isaiah. So you have Isaiah sees it, Daniel sees it, Ezekiel sees it, and John sees it in the book of Revelation. These are the four people who get a chance to see the throne. Some see angels and whatnot. But Ezekiel chapter 1 just fascinated me. It says, And above the firmament, 
that was over the heads was the likeness of a throne and as the appearance of sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. So what you've got is you've got in his mind, remember this is about a 7th century, 6th, 7th century B.C. prophet writing about what he sees. It'd be like Abraham Lincoln trying to describe a laptop in the 1800s. How do you describe it, right? Remember what they used to call a a car? A horseless carriage? Why? Because of lack of a better term. So there's, this is the likeness, and so he sees this, and so he's trying to describe that it looked like this, it looked like that. So verse 27 says, And I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within, and the appearance of his loins down in the waist, even upward from the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had a brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Can you imagine seeing that? Can you imagine if you came to church and every Sunday morning or every Sunday night or whatever you came, there was this appearance of this cloud and there was this fire that was there and there was sounds that you just didn't understand? Wouldn't that draw your attention? That's what the glory of God does. That's what happens when you see the glory of God. That's what happens when you truly get born again and you see the grace and the Lord's mercy in your life, which is new every day, and you get a chance to see God glorify him. That's why I try to tell everybody that I talk to, I preach, I teach to an audience of one. It's Jesus Christ. When we sing, we should be singing as if Jesus is standing right here looking at us going, doing a good job, Mike. Keep singing. You're focused. Purpose. Why are you here today? Because you got a good breakfast? Are you here today because someone drug you here? You're here today because this is what you always do? Are you here today because you want to meet with the, the one who has the glory of the Lord? That's what Jesus is. Isaiah got a chance to see this in Isaiah chapter 6. The year Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon, upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple, and above it stood a seraphim, uh, the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and twain covered the face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, Isaiah sees this 600, 700 years B.C. There's been a lot of history going on. The Lord's glory wasn't filling all that place in Babylon and all these different areas. You think Vegas is filled with the Holy Spirit of God? No, people go out there and they do stuff out there that they wouldn't do anywhere else. Preachers go out there. It's called Sin City for a reason because I can go out there and do it because everything is okay in Las Vegas. You can do whatever you want. Holy, 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 the earth is full of his glory. In other words, it's there. We just don't see it. And that's why you have to look at things differently. It's perspective. He says what? I'm a man, I'm undone. Woe is me. I am unclean, a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was as white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000. That's a hundred million. That's a big number. We're worried about a few million coming across the border and we probably ought to. But you know what? A hundred million beings? That's a lot of folks. And he says, 10,000 times 10 stood before me and the judgment and the books were opened. Daniel is sick for 21 days when he gets this vision. Three weeks he's laid up because of what he saw. What do you see in the Bible? Does it lay you up? Does it slow you down? Does it get your attention? Does it change your life? Or is it just information running through my brain? Like this computer. This computer is a nice thing. It's a nice tool. It has a lot of information, but it won't do anything for me unless I push the button and turn it on. It won't do anything if it has no power. Daniel's dream 
about this heavenly side of the angels. He mourns for three weeks, the Bible says. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, it says, The Son of Man sits upon his throne. In verse number 34, it says, And the king inherit, shall inherit the kingdom prepared for the, from the foundation of the world. From the very beginning, God has a kingdom. This whole thing that we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, lady and gentlemen, I think I saw a lady in here, is about a king and his kingdom. It's not about the church. It's not even about getting saved. It's about a king, and he's operating in his kingdom. And God is trying to get us to cooperate with him and work in his kingdom. Because one day the church will be no more, but his kingdom will always be. If you read Isaiah, the Bible says, And the increase of his government and his kingdom essentially will be, have no end. We're getting ready for something amazing to happen in this world because the king is coming. And when the king comes back, he's not coming back as a meek baby born in a stable. He's coming back as the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and he's going to call us out. And then when he comes back at the second coming, I'm telling you what, he is PO'd. That's put out. I know what you were thinking. You guys are from the Midwest. I know what was going on there. Revelation chapter 4, John gets a chance. He sees, he's called up to the to the third heaven, he gets a chance to see stuff, and the guy is speechless. He doesn't know what to say. He's overwhelmed. We know that the Apostle Paul got up in paradise in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and saw things that he couldn't talk about because John was going to talk about them, but he saw things that were unspeakable for him. They were overwhelming to him, and he comes back and he becomes a suicidal maniac because he's trying to get back to what he saw. That's why when you get a real glimpse of heaven, your whole life is focused on that and who is in heaven. Rather than, I got to go to church, I got to read my Bible, I got to pray, I got to give, I got to serve. You get to. This is a privilege that we get to do in the kingdom. That's why I'm, I believe we, we need to be on a rediscovery process. You know, in the 1400s, a man named Christopher Columbus got on a boat sponsored by the Portuguese government and came over to the West because for that time they said the world was flat. And by the way, there's still some people that believe the world is flat. And so he was going to go west, and he discovered the Bahamas. He discovered America, some in South America, and he goes back. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, the Spanish crown wanted to come to the west, and then the Dutch wanted to come, and then the French wanted to come, and then the English came. And you know what they did? They were kingdoms trying to expand their kingdom. Do you know what God's trying to do right now? He's trying to expand his kingdom with some people that are constituents. You are an ambassador for Christ. You are a representative of your government, of another kingdom. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Somewhere up, there's treasures laid up for me somewhere beyond the blue, but maybe not as far as you think, maybe just dimensionally down the road. See, we need to see God as big and mighty and glorious and powerful. That's what Solomon is talking about. When the Lord comes down, if you read the narrative and read all of chapter 8, by the way, chapter 8 of 1 Kings has 66 verses in it. Do you know when he gets down there, it's on the eighth day? Do you know that Solomon at that particular point is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming after our 7,000 years of history are over, and he's going to have the temple on the earth, and he's going to have the, the ark is going to be there, and inside of that ark are going to be the commandments, and the people that are going to be living in that millennium and at that period of time afterward are going to go by the rules again. It's no longer grace through faith. It's you've got to do what God said. And if you don't do it, you're gone. That's the millennium. You get into eternity, it's the eighth day. I'm telling you what, it's something else. Something to look forward to. So we need to understand the original message and the mandate and the mission of Jesus Christ. That's who is the king. And he comes back as the king. That's our message. We need to rediscover that whole process. We need to understand the original purpose that God had for an idea in the beginning. Why did he make this universe? You know, there's a star out there called Betelgeuse. It's, 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 it's 100 times bigger than our star. It says it takes light years for the, just the light to get here to the earth. And God says, and he made the stars also, six words. The Bible talks about how God in the beginning created the heaven and the earth. What the invisible did was make something visible. And his whole basic goal was he wanted something that was in his likeness. Do you remember we read over there in Ezekiel, he saw it as in the likeness it was like, it was similar to what they thought. It was fire. 
And the original purpose of God was to make something where he had a kingdom with he had some constituents that loved him and wanted to love him back. Why did he create the earth? Why is the earth three, three planets from the sun? Why is this the only planet that has life on? Why is this planet the one that he chose? This is on purpose. This universe is on purpose. The word of God is on purpose. God never does anything that's not on purpose. God's purpose for the church and us is, needs to be discussed. What we need to really rediscover is the original idea, the goal for the human race. I mean, it is a race, isn't it? Isn't that what we're hearing today, all about all the race issues? We play the race card everywhere. Well, God's a racist, not about color. He's about the human race. He's about the redemption of the human race. And he's looking for some people that want to work in his kingdom and get that accomplished. So what was the original idea of Jesus? Why I say that is because an idea means you have to have a thought. You know how many people don't know how to think today? I mean, educationally and academically in the world, our children are being dummy down more and more all the time. And the churches are dumbing down their people because if you really study the Bible, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not true. This isn't going on. Why are you telling that? That's what they're hearing because they have something that they know is the truth. The truth sets you free. Ideas outlive men. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle are basically the people of the Greeks who came up with the idea of a republic type of government. That goes way back to Solomon's day. Those guys had no original thought. God had all the original thoughts. And so we have what we call a republic, right? A democracy, freedom to vote, to choose, to live free. That outlived them. Those guys have been dead since the, the third century B.C. So ideas outlive. Ideas transmit words. And we transmit ideas by words. Ideas are exposed through words. Let me hear what you talk about, and I'll tell you what you're thinking. If you think, you'll tell somebody about it. You get an idea. We have all these commercials where people say, you have an idea? Then why don't you call us? We'll help you get that developed. There's a lot of people. I go to Home Depot a lot. When I go to Home Depot, I wish somebody would invent something. Three years later, somebody invented it. I wished I'd have done it. I didn't take the time. I'm waiting for somebody else to do it, right? But it all starts with an idea. Ideas get exposed in our life by words. God wanted to change the world, and he didn't send an army. He didn't send angels. He didn't set a committee. He didn't even send any man. He sent a word. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him not anything was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness did what? It didn't comprehend it. It means it didn't understand it. It didn't know how to think about it. To comprehend means to grasp mentally, to understand. What is a Word? A Word is an idea. God's idea is in Jesus Christ. What God did when he made Jesus, and somehow Adam, or, um, um, Eve, um, Eve, not Eve, uh, Mary and the Holy Spirit got together, and God put this seed in her womb, and the next thing we know, we have a man who's all man, but he also is all God. He's a unique being that God said, this is who I am. I'm articulating my thoughts, my words, into something that you can see. That's why this is an articulation of the thoughts and the mind of God. This is why this book is unsearchable, even though we can search it. It's unknowable, even though we can know it, because it's continuous to get deeper and deeper all the time. And when you realize that God incarnated in flesh to identify in the likeness of man, in the image of God, so that we could, he could identify with us and we can identify with him. So we have the word of God. So what is the word of God? The Greek word for a word in this context is logos. It means an expressed idea or a thought or a motive. Do you know in our King James Bible it's translated 33 different ways, the word logos? That shows you that it has a 
33, 3, 3 is God's number, right? 33 is a perfect number. God, what he's saying is, I am, have the ability to give you my thoughts more than one way. You know, some of you, God speaks to you like this, smack. Some of you is like, hey, Mike, hey, Bob, hey, Bill. Some of you, you got you to gotta bust your head against the wall. You keep trying to go through the wall when there's a door right there. Do you know what I'm talking about? You learn the hard way. Well, the hard way is the best way to learn. Oh, no. <laughs> a wise man hears instruction and we will be wiser. But a fool, wisdom is folly. Wisdom is the ideas that are put in an order that produce a product. God made the world and formed the world by wisdom. What does the Bible say? With all you're getting, get wisdom. And with wisdom, get understanding. In other words, I have all the ideas. Now, how do they work in my life? See, Jesus is God's complete thoughts and ideas in flesh. That's why when he walked around, many people didn't understand what was going on. That's why sometimes when you start walking through the Word of God and you start seeing the mind of God, it's like you're in a cloud. Now, I don't mean an internet cloud. I'm talking about you're just in the days. You don't see what's going on. You don't get it. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, John reiterates basically what I just said. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested... This life of God was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you the, that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh. The Logos, the ideas of God, was made flesh. So in other words, when we have the Word of God in our life, what pastor is doing and what others do to teach you the Word of God or you're teaching someone is you're trying to get them to make flesh of the words, of the ideas. Isn't that right? You teach a per- School teachers do this. This orange and this orange, this is one, this is one. Make two oranges. You're trying to get them to get the concept by something that's physical. You want to see who God is? You remember in John, John 14? Hey, just show us the Father and it'll suffice with us. We'll be happy with that. Hey, how long have I been with you? You want to see the Father? Look at me, is what he said. I am the Father in the flesh. And yet he submitted, he surrendered himself, he yielded himself to God without question. I do always those things that please my Father. Wow, what a statement. A thought, an idea, a concept in the mind was what was in God's mind. And that thought became flesh. A thought creates a concept. Did you ever hear the word conception? You know what happens when your wife conceives or gets conception? A seed is planted and something receives the, the seed. The thought becomes life. The power of an idea of the mind. A misconception is a misunderstanding of the idea. Oh, you misunderstand what I'm trying to say. You, you know what I'm talking about when you see, see that and say that? Precept. Is an interesting word. In Psalm 119, I, I was looking at this the other day. This is so amazing. In Psalm 119, David uses about six or seven different adjectives. They're all nouns, but they're words that describe the law of God. He talks about the law, the commandments, uh, the precepts, and, and uh, all those different things. But he uses one word 21 times, and that's the word precept. The word precept is an interesting word. It's the word, the prefix pre means before, and sept is a root word for thought or word. So a before word is a precept. So David is asking in the Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter of the Bible, and in there he describes his attitude and his love for the things of God, the law of God. But 21 times in the same verse, sometimes it'll say the commandment and the precepts. What David is saying, because David had a heart after the heart of God. Acts tells us that, and the Bible tells us that in the Old Testament, right? He had a heart after the heart of God. Now, your heart isn't the pump. Your heart is basically your mind. Out of it are the issues of life, right? Just like out of your life is your heart. You don't have a physical heart. You don't have a life. And a precept comes from the old word precipio, which means to command, do before or to take. 
That's what Webster says it was. So 21 times he says this. So what David is saying, Lord, I understand your commands, but I want to understand what was your thinking when you came up with these Ten Commandments. Did you ever think about what is God telling me? Why is God telling me to go to Las Vegas and Mark to stay in Kansas City area? Why, did Mark, why does God tell Bobby to go to Africa or Bobby Bonner and come back from Africa? Why, how do we understand that? Because I want to know what's in your mind, God. When you know what's in the mind of God, you know what? You're liberated because you now know what he wants. You know, some folks, Valentine's Day is coming up here, right? Let's say, what, three, four days, five days? All you see now, commercials uh, for get a Valentine. When she says, you don't get me to get me anything, she's not saying the truth, right? That's not in her mind. What she's saying is, you better get me something, right? You better come home with something, too. I don't care if it's at Walmart or wherever it is, but you better come home with something. A candy bar at the gas station. But it's in your mind. See, those things are coming. They keep coming. So when you have precepts, God wants us to think about what he's thinking about. And David is the only man in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit would come on and go off. He said, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, David wasn't a very righteous man most of the time. But God didn't take his Holy Spirit from him. That's why the heart is so important. Ladies and gentlemen, God is after your heart. He has your heart. He has you. Your wife is after your heart. You're after her heart. If you have that, you have the other thing. And God is saying the same thing. I want you to understand the precepts of God is I want you to know and ask the question, what was I thinking about when I moved you from here to there? How you're born and how am I born in this time? Like I said earlier, everything was made for a purpose. My life was made so that God could use me to do something in his kingdom. Now, I had the choice to accept or reject the Lord Jesus Christ many years ago. And I finally accepted him. It changed my life. It changed my life dramatically from the inside out. And he's constantly changing me from the inside out. And all this is happening because the churches today are starting to go down. The decay in the Christian church, and I use that generically, And the Christian church is tragic. People after COVID aren't going back to church. They're taking the easy way out. They're watching it online. Not that that's bad because we we put ours on live online as well because we want to reach people. But we can't we can't change how they're thinking, but we can influence them to hopefully get them to think a different way. That's our job. A few years ago, the Washington Post uh, had an article about a new church in Maryland. And they used a market research uh, service to help them. And what they did is they had focus group. This church designed weekly services with deliberately de-emphasizing Jesus Christ. One of the founders of that church said this, and I quote, The sad fact is the name of Jesus Christ has become for many people exclusionary. How? What, do you th- what a surprise. It is exclusionary. They use Hindu, Zen, intermingle with a few verses from the Bible and recorded music by Willie Nelson in their services. One leader summarized their mission, quote, we're enabling people to discover God themselves, maybe through Jesus, maybe through Buddha, maybe through it in a number of ways, end quote. You know what that's called? It's called pluralistic. You're trying to entertain two things that are different at the same time. It's kind of difficult to do. Do we live in a pluralistic culture? The church is trying to be, as I heard it say years ago, a little bit worldly, and the world's trying to be a little bit churchy. So we got to compromise here. You know, we got to learn to compromise. We got to learn to get along, right? But the story of the Bible is about an exclusionary person, an exclusionary way, and an only way. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. That's pretty inclusive, right? I mean, you got to get it that way, or you don't. That's why God in his Bible narrows it down for his glory to reveal creation, the fall, redemption, restoration. That is the basic me- uh, mechanisms of the Bible. The main subject of the entire Bible is Jesus Christ and his glory, and it's subject around Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. In John chapter 5, verse 39, search the scriptures, Jesus is speaking to the religious crowd. For in them you think you have eternal life. Think. Remember, I talked about a thought, a precept, a concept. It starts with how you think. What are you thinking about right now? Uh, when's it going to be done? 
What's lunch? What are we having for lunch? Where are we going to, who's going to win the Super Bowl? What if you died this afternoon? Do you think you care about the Super Bowl? I'm not saying not to think about it, but you understand what I'm saying? We're, we're, we, our minds are like cluttered. They're just like, if you go in the other room where we had breakfast this morning, in the trash can there are cups that were all nice earlier in the morning. The plates are all dirty. You don't want to go pick them up and use them again, right? But if you look at that, it's like it's cluttered with stuff. Someone says, well, just go get one and wipe it off. It'll be fine. Well, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't go to a restaurant and take somebody else's plate and wipe it off and just start using it, wiping off their silverware and using it. No, because we're cluttered. we got too much stuff. We don't want that junk in our lives. In fact, it's so amazing to me as I read through the Word of God, I see that the Bible tells me this, is that God's Word is so rich and so sweet and so precious and so powerful to transform how we think. That's why the Bible uses the word shadows. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 17, it says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. He's talking about focusing on God. The Old Testament is saturated with the Messiah. The Jews were, were, were infatuated with who is the Messiah, who's going to have the Messiah. When boy, baby boys were born, the first thing they did was, maybe this is the Messiah. They waited for a long time for a Messiah to come, and they wanted a Messiah to come to free them up. But true freedom is in here. That's why if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, people are being burnt at the stake, burned alive, and they're singing praises to God because it's in here. This is why when you go through the death of a loved one or a tragedy in your life or difficulty or struggles or setbacks, you have something inside that is stable, that is strong. Because the concept of who he is and who you are and what he's doing, it's about a purpose. Think about this. When you go through trouble and difficulty in your everyday life, you know what God's doing? It's an opportunity for him to shine in your life. But we see it as, oh, I got a flat tire. Oh, I got this. Oh, I got that. I had to have problems. I got so many problems, I don't know what to do. He does. Maybe God says, hey, look, some trouble is a measure of our worth. Let me give you some trouble. Somebody doesn't want to have any trouble, though, right? Uh, there's a gentleman named uh, Jimenez, and he has a, a blog and a, a, uh, uh, a website, and he talks about progressive churches in America. You've heard about those, I'm sure, right? They have those even in Kansas City area. You know what a progressive church is? A Christian church that you can do whatever you want and be whatever you want. Just say you're a Christian. You can be gay. You can be uh, a lesbian. You can be a homosexual. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can party on Saturday night and go to church on Sunday morning and give praise to God. You can sing Christian songs and you're okay. It's like the old country western guys when I was a kid. They always at the end of their concerts would sing a hymn and that made it all right. Right? Anyway, he writes about these, uh, this Jimenez guy. He writes about it. And he says some amazing things. He says, listen, many teachers and churches now offer a version of Jesus which emphasizes friendliness, acceptance, inclusion, and the key word, tolerance. Tolerance. In essence, some have made Jesus into a bobblehead who simply gnaws at everything we do. Since we see Christian leaders deconstructing and even sliding into the rank of apostasy, we shouldn't be surprised that many are making Jesus into their own image, end quote. Let's make Jesus our buddy, our co-pilot. Amazing. Lest we think we falsely understand the truth, independent Baptist churches are not all there either. A large 800 people, roughly, independent Baptist church that I'm aware of, took a survey of its people, asked them some questions. One of the questions was this, just one of several. God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. They asked that question to their members. 70% strongly disagreed. Well, 7 out of 10 said, no, that's not right. 45 people out of that group of 800 either strongly agreed or agreed with the statement. Yes, there's other ways to get to God. 69 out of the 800 were unsure of how to answer. So you're talking about 100 and some odd people, an eighth of the whole congregation that teaches the Bible and salvation by grace and the word of God and sing praises to God, don't even know that there's only one way to heaven. Now, that's, a, that's not a large number, but the numbers are increasing. The numbers of people that, that don't believe in absolute truth is astronomically high. When you stand up and say, this is the absolute truth, they, well, that's your opinion, Mike. The Word of God is absolutely true. We have to be diligent with our doctrine. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, Paul tells him, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. 
continue within them, for in doing this thou shalt, also, shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. He says, what is this? He says, take heed to yourself under your doctrine, your teaching, what you believe. What is your thinking? He says, take heed, watch out for it. And Jude, uh, verse 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, I, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We don't have any contenders anymore. We have consumers. We go to church to consume, not to go get fed to contend. Really, when we come together on the weekends, we come together for meetings like this. You know what happens? We're the church. This is just a building. A lot of people say that is the church. They think that's the church. And your pastor is a religious leader, and we have basically a religion. This is what we do. But the kingdom out is everywhere, and we're supposed to be living in the kingdom for the king. So it's time for us to earnestly contend for the faith. Can I ask you a question? Are you contending for the faith? How do you contend for the faith? Well, you live for him, you study, you pray, and you look for opportunities to talk about your king and his kingdom. If you read through the Bible, you see a word country. God said, get out of this country to another country. If you read the book of Hebrews, these people that were all died in faith were looking for a city who has builders and makers that have foundations and a, and a country. They're looking for a new country. You and I, if we're saved, are ambassadors for Christ. Remember that? I represent another kingdom. We have ambassadors in our country. We send ambassadors to other countries. You know what they do? They're supposed to represent us and what we believe. Does anybody in your kingdom, in your country, where you live now, do they understand you're an ambassador? Do they understand who you are, who you represent? Do they understand what you're thinking? My hope and my prayer is that you will realize that. And so since so many scores of churches are becoming progressive, which is a joke, and heresy is running rampant. It's crazy what we're trying to do. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, if you have your Bibles, take a look at that real quickly, your tablet or your phone or whatever you want. In, first Corinthians, or in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Who is, talking about Jesus, this is the superiority of, of our Savior, who is the image of the invisible God, for the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. All right, so what did God make in Genesis 1? He made the heaven and the earth. It doesn't say heavens, it says heaven, right? Uh, things that are visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That shows me there's four truths about Jesus in those verses. And that is, number one, that Jesus revealed who he was about himself. Whoever, he says in John 14, 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, says, who being the, bright, uh, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That is the character and the person of Jesus as revealed. He's unique in verse number 15. He's the firstborn of every creature. Jehovah Witnesses believe he's the, this verse teaches that Jesus is created being and therefore not God. Actually, the phrase firstborn is most frequently translated heir or owner in other passages of Scripture. In ancient times, it meant the ranking one or the supreme one. Jesus is the supreme one. He's the firstborn of every creature. He's the creator of all things in verse number 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So Jesus isn't just a mere man. He's the creator of all things that we can see and that we can't see. That's the God that you serve. That's the God that I serve. That's the God that we're going to be with for eternity. He is our King. He is our Lord. He is the one who is preparing us by getting our thoughts straightened out. He's not only a creator, but he provides the purpose for his creation. You know, I was thinking about this. Mosquitoes, I hate mosquitoes. One of the reasons I moved to the dry desert was mosquitoes. But you know, somehow people from California are bringing mosquitoes to Vegas. I don't know how it works, but I think they're hitching rides or something. But they don't last too long because it's too dry for them. But roaches, birds, bees. They say if we didn't have bees, we wouldn't have a planet. 
we didn't have birds, we wouldn't have bushes and trees because they drop their seeds all over after they process the skin on the outside of them. Everything has got a purpose. Everything. God was thinking thoroughly. So when you think you're junk or you are a mistake, let me just say something. God didn't make any mistakes on you. You're not, you're not a fluke. You're not a freak of nature. You're not too inferior. You're not too, because you're shorter and you're taller. It doesn't mean anything. You have hair. It doesn't mean you're superior, right? Baldy guys, stick with me. Help me out now, right? It just means you have hair. I often wonder, what's the purpose of that, Lord? I, I don't get that. Why don't I not have hair on the top of my head? And I have hair on my shoulders that's about this long. What, why is that, Lord? I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to transplant it because we wouldn't know for sure where it came from. Did you get a hair transplant? Yeah. It looks like a strange place where you took it from. No, I, I don't want to do that. In John chapter 8, verse 54, it says, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, and of whom ye say that he is your God. He's talking to these religious people. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. That's how Jesus talked to these guys. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. Verse 57 of John 8. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old. How canst thou see? Say, they see you've seen Abraham. Jesus saith unto him, Verily, verily, I send to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Wow. He nailed the lid in the coffin. These guys were, We're of Abraham. Well, I am the I am. I am the guy that called Abram out of his family. Jesus is not only creator, but he does all that for his purpose. The goal is to, of his creation is to glorify Christ. The goal of the temple that Solomon dedicated with all of its broad beauty. And in the next chapter, the queen of Sheba comes up and she says, I have not seen half of what I've heard. This, this is amazing. You've gone way beyond. And you'll find that Solomon goes on and he, he, he has gold that's coming in from all over the world to him because he is the ruler of the world. He's the picture of the Lord Jesus. Revelation chapter 4, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. And then in verse 17 of Colossians, it says this, and he says, listen, I want you to understand something powerful here. He said, uh, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. He holds all things together. We know in Hebrews, He upholdeth all things by the word of His power. To consist means to prevent something from falling into complete chaos. You know, if you look around the world, it's like we're in complete chaos, isn't it? Your life ever look like that, feel like that? It's in complete chaos? Mine has over time. Sometimes this comes at me, that comes at me, this going on, that's going on, this happens, that happens, and it's just like, stop. And the Bible says all things in him consist means he's keeping them from falling into chaos. They're to set together. Christ is before all things, both in time and in rank. He's not only creator of the world, but he is the cohesive gorilla glue, if you please, that holds it all together. When things is going crazy, you're not. You remember when the boys were on the boat with Jesus, his disciples? Lord, don't you care that we perish? Jesus is sleeping. These are professional fishermen, and Jesus is a carpenter laying asleep in a boat, not worried about it. And what happens? You don't care. Jesus gets up and he goes, peace be still. Poof. What did Peter say? Even the elements obey him. It isn't about obedience. It's about the power of the creator. It's the power of the one that we serve that controls everything. Friends, we don't have to be shaken or ashamed because Jesus is upholding everything by the word of his power. So people don't believe, don't want to believe. That isn't an issue. The issue is God is still upholding his word and it's still going to come to pass no matter what they believe or don't believe. Listen, hell is real and heaven is real. Hell is hot and painful and horrible and dark and heaven is sweet and wonderful because God made it that way. All things are made by him and for him. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. But Jesus says in John 6, and if he cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. You've got to come unto him. This pluralistic society just continually keeps knocking us down, and I'm asking you to think seriously about who the I am is in your life. 
I mean, when Solomon dedicates that temple, if you read in, in 1 Kings chapter 8, he starts to stand after the, the priests bring down the Ark of the Covenant with the staves in it, and they take it into the Holy of Holies. And then Solomon stands up with his hands up to pray. And by the time he gets through praying, he's on his knees. Because in, when you worship truly God, it's a humbling experience because you realize you who you're in front of. You're in front of the one who said, let there be light. And there was light. Let the dry land come forth, and it came forth. And he gets down and he molds man out of the dust of the ground. And then he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That's why you're immortal on the inside. Your soul's going to live somewhere forever after you're born into this world. He is amazing. I am. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the vine. I'm the alpha, the omega. I'm the resurrection life. Jesus claimed to be God, and no other religious leader ever did that. Muhammad didn't. Buddha didn't. Confucius didn't. No one else did the miracles that he did, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, rose again so that we could be saved and promised that he was coming back to get us and is still alive and well in the planet Earth and in the universe and in the heavens. That's the God that we serve. That's why we need to be all in. God isn't looking for part-time sons and daughters. You're not wanting to be part-time husband, part-time friend. Part you want to have friends. You want to have a connection. You want to have a relationship. That's why the verse in the Word of God, uh, the I am, begins with I. You know, I was looking at this interesting. I, I have a, a book that I got, a Bible that I got. It's called the First Mention Bible. And the guy goes through, and every time a word is first mentioned, he highlights it. And then if it's underlined, because it's more important. And he has at the end of each book, he has a summary of important importance. He calls it nuggets of, let's say, the book of First Kings. So I went back and I looked what he said about First Kings chapter 8. And he was talking about in there uh, what, what's going on. He said, listen, this chapter is amazing because, like I said earlier, it has 66 verses in it, which is like the Bible. The 66th uh, verse becomes the eighth day after that. And we have a picture of the Lord in the future in the book of 1 Kings. So the throne of God, because God is not bound by time, what happens the throne of God when he comes down and he, it, once he came down in the temple after Solomon's praying, God filled it up that the priests couldn't do anything like they did over there uh, earlier in the tabernacle. And when Moses was up there, you couldn't see because he came down to where they were, where we are. And he filled the place up. You know what God wants to do with you? He wants to fill you up. He wants to fill you up to use in your kingdom. Not to use you abusively, but to use you properly. When you understand and you get the right thinking in your head and that you decide, I want to contend for the faith, I want to be all in, you know what will happen? You'll get all in. You say, well, I'm waiting for my buddy to do it. I'm waiting for my wife to do it. I'm waiting for a friend to do it. I'm waiting for the right time. This is the right time. We need to be all in. Because the glory of God deserves it. The Savior who died on that cross deserves your love and your worship. He deserves for us to follow him since he said that I am the way. You know, the, tru the truth is the scariest commodity in the world is when we hear, that might be true for you, but it's not true for me. You hear that today about, that's your truth? Well, I have my truth. No, there's only one truth. That's why George Barna says he's discovered that 75% of Americans do not believe in absolute truth. 75%. That's crazy. What are some action steps that you can do? Number one, if you're not saved, if you're not born again, you need to put your faith, you need to trust Christ as Savior. You need to trust him and believe on him, and you need to repent of your sin. And you don't hear that word anymore in churches. I'm sure you do here, but changing your mind about this to that, going this way and you go that way. I'm tired of sin. I want rejection. I'm tired of living without Christ. I want Christ. I want to have a king in my life that loves me and cares for me because apparently, frankly, we don't really love and care for ourselves as much as we should. We just need to stand up and do that. We need to put our faith in Christ. You need to tell others about Christ. You need to tell others about the Lord Jesus, how he saved you. Give him your story. You should learn how to give your testimony in two minutes or less. You should write it down, three paragraphs. Just tell them about what God did for you in your life. And don't water it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. You're probably familiar with that. What? 
Now listen to this word. No, you know what that is? That's a thought. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your bodies and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, the Logos that's in you, the thought of God incarnate in you, he says, don't you know that he's in you? You know, I'm, I, I have a lady in our church. She's been in our church for 20 years, ever since she was a kid. She comes to me all the time. She says, Pastor, I don't know if really sure if I'm saved. Well, Pastor, she'll come to me after she gets that kind of handled. Uh, Pastor, I don't really know what the plan of God is for my life or the will of God is for my life. She, she, I've talked about it. We have a discipleship lesson number 10 is on what is the will of God. She's been discipled. Something is missing here. Something, you know what it is? It's the thought process. I'm trying to get her to think the way God wants her to think, but she doesn't know. And if you don't know, folks, guess what? You're confused. If you don't know that you're saved, you're going to battle and rock, rock back and forth with that issue. If you don't know what God's called you to do, if you don't know what your purpose is, you're going to have a very unfulfilled life. But let me just close with this. Your existence is evidence that this generation needs something that your life contains. You've got something that somebody needs or you'd be gone. Y'all will you hear me on that? Why you're still here, old or young or in between, is because God has some purpose for your life. You need to discover it. If you don't discover it, you need to try. And the way you do that is get in that word, get on your knees and pray. Talk to your pastor. Talk to somebody on the staff. Get yourself together, but get focused. Contend for the faith. To be a contender, you have to be in shape in boxing, in MMA, Right? Oh, I'm going to go up there. I think I can go box that heavyweight. Yeah, I'm about the same weight. Good luck. I'm not in contention. We need to be in contention with this world, not with one another. Amen? The Logos is in you. The Word of God, God's thoughts are in you. Trust Him and follow Him. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you this morning that we've had this chance to reflect on the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and your glory and all that you've done for us. Thank you for giving us your word that instructs us so we have the right thoughts in our mind, so we can have the right conceptions, the right ideas about life, so that we can take the right steps of action to serve you in your kingdom because we know that we're going to a different country when you come and that the rules are different there than they are here. And we know that you'll be there and so it'll be okay. Lord, I pray you'd bless these men, Lord, as they wrestle with or battle with problems that they struggle with. Lord, help them to see who they are in Christ. Help them see that they're complete in him. Help them to see, Father, that they're accepted in the beloved. Help them to see that the truth is inside of them. and They need to fan the flames of that truth. Lord, do an amazing thing in the lives of these folks. I pray your name would be honored and glorified, and I'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.